question. Um, uh, Biana's academic and professional background extends in the fields of architecture, computational design, environmental design, data science, spatial computing, and media arts. Uh, Biana's interdisciplinary research has allowed her to understand innovation in design and technology within a broader environmental context and explore data-driven and citizen-centric approaches to improve the built environment. She has taught in many well-renowned institutes around the world, and her research is supported by a number of National Science Foundation grants. She's currently a PhD candidate in the Media Arts and Practice Program at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Hi, Biana. I wanted to welcome you uh, on behalf of TIFA. Uh, can I um, start the camera? Great. Oh, I'm ready. Sure. Hi. Hello. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And then we can begin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to Tifa and um, Serbia21 for an uh, invitation. Uh, I'm Diana Bogosian. And uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And um, hopefully what was highlighted there was my uh, interdisciplinary background and a focus on research and combining my background in architecture and urban design with my current um, PhD studies, which is in media arts. So today's talk is uh, titled Urban Environmental Interfaces, Data-Driven Immersive Media for Participatory Urban Environmental Literacy and Policy. So with that, um, uh, what I have been doing in the past uh, 10 years through teaching and research has been uh, looking at how we can begin to bridge between existing uh, environmental science practices that are applied to the built environment for analysis, for data acquisition and visualization and use media arts and particularly loc locative media arts um, to begin to bridge existing uh, gaps in research and at the same time create, um, make public literacy an important component of this conversation. So uh, a lot of my research has uh, focused on air quality data acquisition and visualization. Uh, and part of it is because I've spent most of my life in Los Angeles, which is a city which has a very long history of uh, dealing with environmental issues. So for instance, the first Clean Air Act in the United States was um, passed in Los Angeles. And due to that, then cars were required to have sensors for monitoring smog. At the same time, my current teaching is in Miami, which is a city that is dealing with uh, sea level rise very actively. So with the scientists here and within School of Architecture, I'm looking at ways that we could create devices and visualization methods that are trying to communicate the urgency of the issues, but also existing research to the public. So um, environmental issues um, have been um, highlighted since the modern environmental movement in, from late 1960s. And uh, since then, over the decades, many cities have adopted um, methods for combating these issues. And what has been interesting as a conclusion has been that a lot of uh, policymakers and a lot of scientists have highlighted the importance of communicating this information with the public and with one another. So one of the, let's say, most um, overt ways that these efforts have been formalized has been uh, how uh, UN has put forward sustainable development goals. And with this, the idea was to try to simplify the issues as much as possible and through visual communication and icons, uh, and classification try to communicate urgency of focus areas and research areas within this field. And again, the, the, goal has, the goal here has been communicating this urgencies with the public. So how could we communicate the urgency and nuanced nature of environmental pollutants? And the nuance here is quite important because we're, uh, what you're gonna see is the fact that these information that we're acquiring and visualizing are often very complex, but perhaps in order for us to bridge this gap, we do need a certain level of uh, simplification. 
uh, and maybe assumptions that we um, can make about the role of uh, information visualization and certain techniques that are already established. So with that said, I'm going to uh, quickly go over uh, a few precedents. Uh, so um, let's say the most important visualization in environmental sciences, especially when we're dealing with environmental pollutants, is this curve called the Keeling curve, uh, which uh, was uh, established by a scientist uh, in California that uh, since the late 1950s, he developed a tool for monitoring CO2 levels. And it was the first time where continuous monitoring and visualization led to a lot of environmental conversation. So this Keeling curve is the beginning of modern environmental, uh, environmental movement. And it has been used uh, for, to uh, argue uh, for and against environmental legislation. So it's been used and misused. But over the years, this visualization has um, built, uh, built up and it's quite significant. Uh, at the same time, for instance, um, for the past, uh, apologies, I'm, my slide skip. Uh, for the past two decades, uh, with the incorporation of remote sensing and using satellite imagery, NASA has been able to document, uh, let's say, complexity and, um, let's say, large scale. Um, uh, large scale um, monumental effect of environmental issues. And these um, visualizations were really important um, that uh, NASA has been releasing annually since um, mid 2000s and has communicated uh, some um, general, uh, let's say, assumptions that we can make about socio political, but also environmental uh, efforts currently activating, uh, being applied. And uh, from my background in architecture, information visualization and representation is key, but I'm very much interested in uh, certain precedents, such as in this case, Hugh Ferris's visualization of a skyscraper uh, shadow projections over cities in Manhattan, and how he was able to, through visualization, communicate how setback laws, so this is if you're building certain height, then you need to actually reduce the, the mass going forward. He was able to uh, communicate the importance of um, uh, allowing sunlight being projected on street levels just through the use of this visualization. So these visualization then led to zoning law. So I'm very much interested in how contemporary visualization could create uh, new types of zoning and regulations within cities as well. So with that said, let's look at how currently environmental information is being uh, documented and utilized. So uh, coming from an architectural background, what I do teach to my students is often simulation tools. And currently um, the state of the art um, visualization tools, uh, in order for them to begin to simulate a site in this case, or uh, let's say uh, a, a portion of a city, they need to rely on uh, already existing data generated from weather stations. So for instance, I was teaching uh, for a very long time, um, for many years in New York. And for us, let's say if we wanted to simulate something in Manhattan, we had to rely on this existing weather stations. So uh, what you're gonna find out is that some of these are repetitive. It's actually quite scattered. So um, what we're realizing is that even when we are relying on, let's say high-end simulations, but the data source is still quite scarce. So those data sources come from these things called weather stations. And usually these weather stations, they are using really expensive tools for high temporal spatial uh, uh, information collection. But as you can see, they're usually placed, um, let's say, away from the city and in locations that are called usually idealized locations. So therefore, they don't really capture the nuanced nature of how cities and pollution and microclimates are being constructed. And at the same time, when you do simulation with this um, scattered uh, data, you are able to get results. But as you can imagine, they're not really local to that specific site. At the same time, opposite of this, if you are relying on collecting your data, so here I was doing a workshop in American uh, University of Armenia, and we wanted to look at relationship of pollution and vegetation. But what we realized was that we were lacking um, vegetation information specifically location of trees and types of trees. So instead of actually doing the simulation as a class, we decided to invest time in creating a new database for the city. So students spend weeks walking the city and we developed this app for capturing a location and type of the trees 
and then converting that to a GIS data that we could then share with the city. But this was, as you can imagine, very, very time consuming. Or with uh, students at uh, SIARC, we were looking at, again, um, collecting information about uh, tree types, uh, the, let's say the height of uh, the tree, but also the canopy and relationship of that to CO2 capturing that students did uh, with walking with sensors. So again, very interesting way of creating um, new information, but it's very time consuming when you have a, let's say a small group dedicated to this. But we learned quite a lot um, in terms of developing sensors and developing visualization methods that sometimes real time and sometimes using status, um, data, static data could um, communicate this information in different, using different views uh, and uh, different modes. So if we were to look at a relationship of information uh, collection, um, uh, existing information visualization method, we can break it down into local versus remote and static versus dynamic. And here we're talking about relationship of the sensor to the, uh, to the object that is trying to capture. And these are the classification that uh, my colleague Maida Yaguno and I have put together and we've been using for many years in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, framing our work uh, in this context. So for instance, if we look at the weather stations as an example of uh, a, a sensor that is static, but has high temporal resolution, it is quite costly, but it has no spatial resolution because as mentioned, it's away from the city. At the same time, for instance, the example that we saw with Sayark or with students in Armenia, here students were walking or biking or using, uh, let's say, uh, mobile methods to collect information. So in this case, we're lacking temporal resolution because we don't have many people sampling at the same time, but we're gaining low, a high spatial resolution. And through redundancy, we're able to actually build a database and then use media for visualization. So for the architectural research that we're gonna see going forward and the type of um, methods that I will be presenting, we're gonna focus on local mobile sensing. And this is something that actually is not new. London as the first industrial city uh, used um, scientists, um, scientists called Luke Howard used uh, um, local uh, mobile sensing where so he paid high sensors to the cars and he began to monitor pollution in the city. And at the same time, uh, beginning to overlay this information, uh, of pollution information over topographic and also uh, other um, GIS information has been something that's been uh, quite, um, it's been building over time. So for instance, there's a set, set of maps uh, called uh, Climate Last, and they are, it's a continuation of uh, visualization that allows scientists and data uh, and urban planners to overlay pollution information over cities. So these have been quite um, inspirational. So if we look at existing uh, apps and uh, let's say interfaces for uh, monitoring pollution and visualization, a lot of them do rely on maps for showing geolocations. They are relying on also icons and uh, gradient visualization for representing a variation in readings. Um, but at the same time, what's really interesting when studying this is the fact that they have a very um, limited number of audience and usually people that tend to download one app then they go to the next one. These are the same people that would go to community meetings. And also the use of these apps decline over time. So um, usually they don't really uh, capture people's interests over a long period of time. I personally have uh, tens of these apps on my phone and I, I'm always curious to look at them, but I never really continue um, engaging with them as uh, I don't really find an incentive for going back. So um, how can we then begin to think about more exploratory way of information visualization in this context? So John Tukey is a statistician uh, that since 1950s, he put forward this theory of exploratory data analysis, which was a way of looking at data without making a hypothesis. So usually scientists make a hypothesis before looking at information, but can we perhaps look at data patterns and um, perhaps immerse ourselves in the um, in the information that we're seeing before we make a hypothesis. So I'm very much inspired by John Tukey's exploratory data analysis um, model. 
So uh, what uh, I have been doing is to uh, look at ways that uh, participatory methods of bringing citizen and policymakers and scientists together could become a way for us to then engage with information visualization. So this workflow is one that I've been using for a lot of air quality visualization and the projects that you'll see going forward will highlight uh, certain aspects of this. So the first project started by looking at University of Southern California, which is in Los Angeles, right where I do my studies, but also it's in a um, highly um, uh, concentrated area, high density, it's surrounded by a series of um, uh, highways and we begin to create these um, uh, calibrated but low cost sensors uh, within this box that we 3D printed that if you could, um, it, it, had a, uh, it had a way of attaching to bikes, um, let's say you can attach it to your uh, basket, but at the same time, this the same box, if you were to, um, this is an initial uh, early study before we design the box to do real time visualization of some of the volunteers. The same box, uh, if you were to flip it over, it would allow you to attach to drones. So here you're looking at two, uh, two of the volunteers um, traveling with the box. And uh, this was some of our early visualizations that allowed us to just look at how often we wanna visualize the information and what are the parameters. So here we're only looking at temperature and we realize actually Although there is variation and we attributed that to topography, when people look at this visualization, it really doesn't strike a lot of difference. So then we um, looked at, well, can we look at visualization methods like MATLAB to then skew the information and see if we can get results. But we realized that actually, uh, perhaps we need to think about a more immersive method. So here you're looking at two of the variables, so which is temperature and CO2 map as color gradient and uh, pixelation value. So the color of temperature is mapped to temperature. So warmer it gets, more red it becomes, and cooler it is, more blue it becomes, and pixelation is CO2. So here we're outside of campus going towards the freeway. So you can see the pixels are starting to increase and it creates a sense of uh, things becoming more blurry. So for those of you living in large city, you know when the days are quite, uh, days that you go outside that are quite muted, there is this sense of actually graining us, right? So we try to capture that using media. And what we realized was that actually just relying on two methods, it was quite effective for people to understand what we were trying to communicate. So in the upper left corner, you see uh, somebody biking and this is capturing their camera. Um, so it's more uh, open green area. So the color is more blue um, and there's lower uh, pixel size versus the ones that go outside. They're using higher pixel size and also color becomes warmer. So uh, we were also looking at the buildings in Z direction. As I said, the same sensor kit, we could flip it, attach it to a drone and then begin to map the building. So here we're looking at a typical building on campus and here we're also coupling um, the mapping, uh, real-time graphing with this. So as the drone lifts up and we were able to program the speed um, and um, the path, um, you can see that CO2 drops, temperature drops. So you actually see the clarity being part of that visualization. And at the same time, what's great about using drone, if it goes up, it needs to come down, hopefully. So then we are able to do two sampling at the same time with a slightly different um, coordinates. So again, the drone becomes, uh, it's, it's lowering, the pixels increase, color temperature increase. So we were able to map the entire campus. Uh, it was a quite tedious uh, experience, but uh, what we were able to generate at the end was a gradient map of campus and we realized at the end that there are some interesting corner to study. So number three that you see in the upper right corner, we found that that was the most polluted area. And after weeks of uh, analysis, we realized that that was actually uh, not due to anything that we could have done on campus, but because it was due to the, uh, the length of the traffic lights. And uh, we realized that if we were to just add a sensor to the traffic lights, we would be able to actually lower um, the emission because cars would not be idling. With that, we went to the provost of university, started a conversation that then led to conversations with the city. So again, just by doing this visualization, we were able to actually identify this problem area and tackle that. With that, uh, we took the project further uh, for City of Seoul in 2017. 
for the Biennale, we work with the city um, to the, do a visualization of the pollutants. So Seoul is an interesting case because it gets a lot of its pollutants from China. Uh, and for many years, they were saying, well, it's not our problem because we're not the ones producing the pollution and it's something that we're inheriting. But you cannot actually use that attitude, right? Because your people are at the end being affected. So the, uh, the mayor's uh, claim for his selection was to address this thing called per, um, yellow dust, which was combination of a particular matter. So that allowed us to actually create these sensors uh, along with my colleague, Marjo Yeruno, uh, these sensors that had high pool magnets and they were solar powered. Uh, we had a number of them that were attached to uh, a bus um, in the city, uh, Platus. Um, and um, it was quite easy to climb and attach these uh, to top of the buses. And uh, we were able to then collect data for uh, the, the, the months of the Biennale. And uh, at the same time, we had an exhibition that was happening uh, in the, the area of the Biennale. And we were able to use this data for three different types of visualization. So here it was a real time uh, website that uh, people were able to track the buses and look at the values, for instance, temperature, humidity, CO2, ozone, et cetera. That was part of the reading. At the same time, we had an AR app where allowed people to, very much inspired by what we did at USC, walk around the city and create this color um, um, filters um, by either connecting to the nearest weather station or by connecting to the, uh, the sensors that we had running in the city, because we only had access to uh, six of the sensors at a time, so we had to rely on weather stations. At the same time, um, we uh, actually created another augmented reality app for the exhibition that was happening within the Biennale environment. Seoul has 25 different districts, so we worked with the city officials to gather 30 years of pollution information from their weather stations. So this app had a real-time mode and archival mode. Right now you're looking at the archival mode where you're going through 30 years of pollutant. And these are visualized as these pollution maps over the districts of the city. So for instance, here we're looking at sulfur or nitrogen dioxide. We're able to walk over this map, which was two, um, over two meter by two meter. Uh, and at the same time, you can switch to a real-time mode. You can turn on tocos on and off. And what was nice about this, we were able to quickly engage people by uh, kind of encouraging them to look for where they were living, right? So people were able to find their own home and understand the relationship of this to the pollution. So this was quite um, engaging in terms of uh, speaking to people, but also engaging the kids. I'm going to end with uh, one project which um, is built on this. And with the SOAP project, we realized that actually we did not have enough data to make some major assumptions, but we were very much inspired by the interaction. So this last project that I'll be sharing uh, is a short project, um, is, um, is, is a continuation of the research and we work with an IoT, um, with, an, uh, with an IoT uh, research collective at USC and they already had a number of sensors that were uh, integrated on campus and we created this AR app which it would allow you to find these sensors. So these arrows would tell you where to go to find these sensors. So uh, once you would locate a sensor, uh, these were very much work in progress. It would show you what the sensors were inside the box. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you could uh, you know, engage with the sensors. You can go and find uh, all of them. And, and when you did, you got a, there was an incentivization method for doing so. At the same time, you could use your student ID card to pull up the campus map and figure out where all these sensors are located. And by clicking on each of the markers, you were able to then look at weekly uh, trend reading all the pollution. And this allowed us to go to any student with a student ID card and engage them in these locations. And we were able to um, make some assumptions about their interest and perhaps their engagement effort. Uh, unfortunately, COVID happened and we were not able to finish this project. So right now we're in the process of rethinking the next phase. So I will end with um, uh, this uh, slide. Um, and uh, in a sense, the idea here is to use uh, existing uh, familiarity of people. Everybody at this point has played Pokemon Go, but can we start to think about uh, similar methods for engaging people with environmental issues? Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, Biana. That was great. Uh, I think it's really interesting to see how much actually goes on, uh, you know, in the process of creating these projects because technically also they are very complicated and they require interdisciplinary works. Um, but we're running a little bit short of time, so I'm just going to go with asking one question. Um, Kashmira asks, uh, is it interesting that you take, uh, it is interesting that you take the aspect of interaction for urban city, uh, urban or city scale projects. Uh, in India here, we're not so technologically advanced yet. Um, but do you have difficulties explaining to people how to use these tools? Uh, and what age groups are they from and how do you tackle this problem? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so with any interaction, there's um, usually some standard questions that you will be asking. One of the main ones is who is your audience? And um, it's slightly different when you ask these questions uh, from an architecture perspective, you have this thing called a client. With even cities, you also have people that are funding the research. But with interaction design, the first thing is who is your audience? And over the years, um, I have really struggled with this because in my ideal scenario, I would make an app or an interaction that would engage the citizens and the public. But the reality is that um, you know, the technical difficulty or the technical challenge of communicating something to the scientists is perhaps slightly different than to the general public. And um, the truth is that um, everything has to go through playtesting. And in our lab, we're very much, um, we're very uh, active in creating these things called user stories, which I'm sure those of you in UI UX are very familiar with. And we spend a lot of time creating user stories, which allows you to put yourself, not only imagine yourself as a user, but actually verbalize as a user, I would need to do A, B, and C. Um, and at the same time, um, there's, uh, I think, a level of, um, level of um, I think, um, subjectivity that we should take, because if we just assume people are going to use what they know, then we will just give them um, what they already know, right? But I think it's important to look for, um, I know that earlier uh, there was this comment about gamification, but there are some things that we can learn from. Um, uh, game mechanics uh, for incentivization. So usually these are classified as in four parts. It's either uh, for research, it's either for a monetary game, and we've seen this in a lot of cities. If you collect the bike, you would get certain points. It's either for activism, and I mentioned activism because the apps that I showed earlier, those are only downloaded by activists. And the last one is entertainment, and that's what Pokemon Go really captured well. So if you have these things of research, activism, monetary game, and entertainment, and maybe use um, different uh, uh, maybe aspects of this in each research, then you would be able to advance, um, uh, advance engagement. But I think it's an ongoing struggle and a question. Yeah, and I mean, especially here in India, it's, it's really hard because also we have so many age groups, so many languages. Um, so yeah, I think that was an interesting question. Uh, last fun question, what are you playing these days and what are you reading? What video games are you playing these days? So uh, I have to admit that I'm, um, I'm not a very big, um, I don't play video games often, uh, but uh, some of my latest uh, favorites in terms of uh, inspiration has been uh, Cuphead. So it's, I don't know if anybody has played it, but it has a, a very incredible uh, storyline behind it. It's a very uh, difficult one. And um, it it's uses, uses combination of, uh, let's say, um, old Hollywood graphics in addition to some uh, live action to uh, create this level. So I, if anybody is interested in difficult, but very graphically engaging video game, I, uh, I, I recommend Cuphead. Uh, in terms of reading, I'm very much deep into my uh, dissertation, so all I read is related to that, but I highly recommend um, uh, a book by Kate Crawford called Atlas of AI, which in a very um, uh, elegant way uh, talks about the relationship of technology and artificial intelligence to the larger questions that we should be asking, and a lot of them are 
environmental and ecological, and also a great book by uh, Sarah Williams um, called uh, uh, Data Action that is uh, talking about the importance of information visualization in communication with the public and urgent issues that our cities are facing. Okay, well, I will definitely look into both of them. Um, okay, Biana, thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful having you here. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you so much for everybody and please uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Yeah.